Okay, uh, let's get started. So good afternoon. My name is Atalia Omer, for those of you who don't know me. I'm a professor of religion, conflict, and peace studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, which is a part of the, of the Q School of Global Affairs. I'm um, grateful to professors Asher Kaufman and Ray Offenheiser, directors of the Kroc Institute and, and uh, the Kroc and Polti Institutes, respectively, for their enthusiasm and generosity in supporting the visit of Dr. Salem al Qudwa to the University of Notre Dame to share with us his knowledge, experience, and desire to build humanistic structures in the besieged Gaza Strip which has been under total blockade for now almost two decades. It's, um, it's almost a miracle that Dr. al Kudwa is here with us. And I ask for his permission to share um, with you um, his story in recent weeks. So uh, a few short weeks ago, he was traveling in urgency to Waza because news of his mother's stroke reached him in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His family, three young boys and a spouse, picked up and made the hard decision to travel to Raza with the expectation that Dr. al Kudwa's spouse will assume the responsibility, Wajib, to care for the mother while Dr. al Kudwa returns to complete his fellowship uh, with Harvard University. As it so happened when he was in Cairo, because this is the only way for a Palestinian from Raza to travel to Gaza, the horrible news reached him of the unexpected death of his father. Mm -hmm. This is where personal tragedy in Palestine is always mediated through the infrastructure or the architecture, if you will, uh, of Israeli sovereignty and control. It took Dr. al Kudwa two more days to reach home in Gaza to wash his father's body as per the Muslim tradition and say goodbye. He told me last night when we had dinner that his trip back to Waza was kept as a secret from his father who had told him, get out, take care of yourself. You have opportunities in the UK, in the US, stay there, don't look back. Your family has different passports, go and don't come back. But Raza is home and now his spouse and kids are there taking care of Dr. Al-Kudwa's mother as she continues to uh, fortunately recover and stabilize after the stroke. The beautiful two older boys are signed up for the soccer team and Salem showed me the photo. Trying to them. Yeah, yeah, that's how we bribe them to go. <laughs> so they are starting to um, kind of set their roots there again. Salem said he almost wrote to me from Gaza to cancel, uh, to cancel his um, visit to Notre Dame, uh, his, uh, the, the talk, uh, but decided to stick with it. And here he is after a long and hard journey with his family left there. So I'm so thankful and honored um, that you are here with us, Dr. al Kudwa, and condolences. Uh, and now to the formal intro. <laughs> Dr. al Kudwa received his doctorate in architecture from Oxford University. Um, and he is currently a fellow at the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative at Harvard University. He has an extensive experience in the intersection of humanitarianism and development work, building structures or a disaster um, related field of reconstruction with a primary expertise in a strip that is targeted for periodical massive bombardments or what infamously referred to as mowing the lawn in Gaza. His approach to the reconstruction centers marginalized communities as you will hear from him, as a way, um, as a way and framework to combat vulnerability, which is sometimes not accounted for within humanitarian designs. His doctorate from Oxford entailed a focus on participatory design as a form of an architectural process. He has been motivated by questions pertaining to the social agency of architecture and cultural and spatial practices of marginalized communities in a context of urban and state violence. Recently, Dr. al Kudwa was shortlisted for a very prestigious Viba President's Award for Research in 2021 for the contribution of his work to ethical implications of experimental design on affected communities in the, in the Raza. 
Street, Palestine. The description of the, of the announcement of this important award begins as follows. I quote, annihilation in Gaza has become so frequent that houses are being built, destroyed, and reconstructed all at the same time. The description then continues. Dr. al Qudwa's research examines experimental architectural technologies and transitional design for communities in Gaza, asking what is the social role of the architects and international aid organizations in addressing Gaza's housing challenges and struggles? What are the ethical implications of experimental architectural technology and design on behalf of the affected communities in Gaza? And what is the appropriate housing design for marginalized communities that will respect their cultural understandings and engage them over time? So as you can see already, Dr. al Qudwa's work very concretely, as per also the, the title, <laughs> inhabits a place where many of our interests in this space intersect, humanitarianism, development, peace, and justice. So I should end here and just simply let Dr. al Qudwa share with us and deliver his talk titled Beyond the Concrete Borders of Gaza. And again, I'm so deeply honored and privileged to be able to welcome Salem to Notre Dame. So please join me. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Crook Institute and the Polt Institute for uh, inviting me and for hosting the event and mainly for Professor Atalia Omar who took the effort and she kept her promise since the last year of inviting me in person to uh, give this talk to her students and to other colleagues and I was having a great pleasure since yesterday of meeting some of you and having beautiful discussions and also this morning and today's afternoon and night and also tomorrow meeting some colleagues from the School of Architecture. So I would like to start by giving a brief about my, myself. So I was born in, in, in North Africa, in, in Benghazi, in Libya, in the coastal city of Benghazi in Libya. And I really enjoyed having a beautiful childhood, having so many beautiful memories for the first 18 years of my life and traveling to Cairo, Egypt, to see relatives and spending our summer vacation over there while passing through either Cyprus, Malta, uh, or Greece, to spend a couple of days over there. So that thing inspired me a lot, actually, being surrounded by this kind of vernacular architecture and traditional buildings in the Mediterranean. After my high school, my parents sent me to India to study electrical engineering in the hope that I would be a biomedical engineer, combining both medicine and, and engineering. It was the trend of those days, either to study computer engineering or biomedical engineering. I worked very hard, actually, to make my parents happy, but I uh, failed many times to, to, to succeed. So I quit uh, electrical engineering and uh, I love that I have to study uh, architecture using some of my artistic, artistic skills and being inspired by my childhood memories in the Mediterranean and also the vibrant and the colorful life I had in India where I have lived for three years. Lucky enough, uh, I was uh, serving our communities in Gaza directly after my graduation. I worked for like two years and a half at the Palestinian Ministry of Finance, being a project coordinator, working mainly on a project funded by the World Bank and another project funded by the USAID. And uh, after two years of wearing a suit and the time, most of the time me meeting all, uh, donors, I decided that uh, I have to resign from my, my work with the Ministry of Finance. And I decided that it's better to go back to work with communities in need on the ground. So lucky enough between 2006 and 2019, I was uh, the emergency and the reconstruction architect working with three international NGOs in Gaza, mainly the Islamic Relief Worldwide for seven years, the Norwegian Refugee Council, and recently with the Secure Islamic France. Uh, during that time, I was also a part-time university lecturer, and uh, I kept teaching my students how to imagine, how to bring hope, and how to bring a better future for our communities in Gaza. So it was like bringing the realities and going back to the design studio in order to imagine a better future for, for our people over there. As you can see in this historic map, it's uh, Gaza before being the Gaza Strip. So it's a historic map which dates back to the 16th century. And it's showing Gaza like one of those uh, coastal cities along other cities, Damascus, Haifa, Akka, Yafa, in front of Cyprus and uh, 
it was during that period, actually during the 17th century, when my family or my ancestors moved from greater Syria, from Halab, Halab Aleppo itself to, to, to be located and to live in Gaza since the 17th century. Uh, they have lived in a neighborhood called the Daraj neighborhood, which is uh, one of the oldest part of, 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 of the Gaza city. It's beside uh, Masjid Sayyid Hashem, where the tomb of, or the graveyard of the uh, grandfather of our Prophet Muhammad, peace of him, and an entire mosque have been built uh, uh, on his body. As you could see in this picture, non durable construction materials, primarily mud bricks and mud covered straw characterize the typology of old houses in Gaza. The vernacular architecture of the region is still recognizable in some parts of old Gaza city. So you could see one of the oldest mosques, Masjid Katibulaya, beside another church in Gaza in the same neighborhood, the Darish neighborhood. Because of its location at the cross uh, roads of Africa, Asia, and Europe, Gaza has been uh, the battleground of the great powers in the region throughout its history. Conquerors of the region included Egypt, Assyria, Macedonia, Rome, Byzantium, Arabia, and Turkey. This diversity can be recognized on the faces of the people of Gaza. Actually, my PhD supervisor could not imagine that this guy is, is, is from Gaza. She told me that he must be Irish. He <laughs> not he's from Gaza, he's from the northern part of a uh, place called Bethlehem, where mostly fishermen and farmers are living over there. In local Arabic, I will ask you, Inti min dar min, or inta min beit min. Who speaks Arabic over here? Okay. Inta min dar min, or inti min beit min. In local Arabic, inta min dar min, or inti min beit min, which family or home you are, will be the first question that someone will ask you uh, if, or, uh, if she or he meets you for the first time. The Arabic word dar or beit means house. It's customary for people to be identified in everyday interactions by their family name and in a more informal way by their sheer physical resemblance to, the, uh, to other members of their extended families. Home as a physical place of family practices is important in Arabic, in, in Arabic culture, and for the uprooted people, such as the Palestinians, extended family serve as an important institution critical to the survival of their country. As you could see over here, the historic Palestine and Gaza was just like one city of, of other, among other cities of, of Palestinian cities. And then during the 1948 and flux of people who have kept displaced from one place to another. Right now, Gaza is just a small place, which is only like 365 square kilometers, roughly the same as Las Vegas in the US or quarter the size of London in the UK, which is now a home to almost 2 million souls. Gaza is unique in being an area under siege and occupation for over 70 years, and there is no other area of the world so oppressed for so long. What happens to a place and the people who have been placed under siege for so long? So this is going to be uh, the main theme of my presentation, that during each and every phase of our life, we had got like the chances to decide what to do next, to plan for next week or for the next month. But what if two million people have been denied this kind of right to, to have their own choice. During the 2014 assaults, the Israeli forces instructed the population of Gaza to evacuate a three kilometer wide zone. This area was subject to bombardment and then land forces caused further destruction of houses and property. Internal migration occurred within the Gaza Strip from the hazardous and exposed border areas to Gaza city itself caused a significant increase in land prices and housing needs in a situation where available resources were limited. When I put that yellow, uh, yellow uh, circle on that map, I was just locating the exact place of my extended family building, of my extended family house in the northern or in the western part of the Gaza city, a Rimal uh, area, without knowing that in 2021 attacks, that most of the attacks are going to take place at that area. So as you could see in this picture, the recent attacks took place in the buffer zones, so instructing people in Shijailia and Beitlahia and Jabalia and Beit Hamon to evacuate those areas for like two or three kilometers and burning the lands and destroying most of the physical buildings over there. And then people have to take shelter into normal schools and spending maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So that area where my family lived was considered to be the safest part in, in, the, in the whole Gaza Strip. And the 2021 attacks, most of, most of the attacks took place at that, at that area. That's what 
that uh, point when I had a long discussion with my father, asking his, his permission to come back and he asked me to stay. Uh, so when I got back for a short visit this year, totally like entire neighborhoods have been destroyed, political buildings. And Amira Haas, the Jewish uh, uh, journalist, has wrote a very powerful article in the Haas with the title, Israel is wiping out entire Palestinian families on purpose. Uh, the late American architect Michael Sorkin once said that architecture does not create community, but it can provide a setting conducive for the playing out of collective values. Uh, in addition to that, the Scottish architect Kate McIntosh defined that architecture, in addition to providing shelter, it has to liberate people mentally, psychologically, etc. Sadly speaking, this meaning or definition for architecture is totally missing because in Gaza, it's the idea of architecture as destructive, a machine to kill where concrete slabs and columns are smashing human bodies and rubble and shrapnel killing people. Architecture is becoming the graveyard of the inhabitants, the site of memory and something much more absolute. To conclude this part, the unstable economic situation, the shortage in construction materials because of the siege of the blockades in the last 15 years, frequent attacks and military operations in Gaza, the lack of electricity, Below the minimum humanitarian standards, we still do have like 20 hours of electricity cut off per day. Often, all those things forces families to build back lower quality houses. Talking about houses, and I'm asking uh, some of you over here who have an interest in architecture, what's the common features between these three contemporary houses or homes designed by well-known architects or designers from different, different countries? What are the common features that you could see over here? So we do, we do have a house designed by a Japanese architect from Japan, another Spanish architect, and another Latin American architect. What's the common features between those three contemporary minimalist houses? Straight lines. Yeah, exactly. Straight lines. I mean, exactly, straight yeah. Lines. Straight uh, lines, uh, abstract objects, yeah. So it was the artistic choice of the architect or the designer in three different contexts to use the colors, the materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Over here is a typical house in Gaza. It's not actually the artistic choice of the people, rather than it's out of their dire necessity. I'm not appreciating this kind of things actually, but I'm trying to highlight why people in Gaza build such building and in such way. So when you look back, these are minimalist houses who have been published and got so many awards and glossy international magazines while, while the everyday architecture over, over, over there in Gaza is like the common thing. I just put two pictures in contrast. The, the picture to the left is a Japanese house. It's called the Silent House. It has been published, got so many awards. And they took a picture for one worker and they called it a silent moment where a silent Palestinian worker is working just to finish his house or to build his house in less than uh, two weeks. Talking about my experience when I did my PhD at Oxford School of Architecture at Oxford Brookes University, which has nothing to do with Oxford University because Oxford University does not have a School of Architecture. Ah, it's called yeah, Oxford Brookes, Oxford Brookes uh, uh, University. I literally uh, lived and consumed in this building. It's called John Henry Brooks Building. I was lucky enough to start uh, my PhD in 2015, exactly the next year after the opening of that building. Summer 2015. It was the end of my first semester, and there was an electricity cutoff for only 20 minutes in the John Henry Brooks and the Ocker Property Building, where Oxford School of Architecture is located. My office is opposite to the design studios, so I went to have a look around, and it seemed that everyone got bored so quickly. Computers were disconnected from electricity as well as from the internet and Wi-Fi. Students who were sitting in front of their computers never talked to each other but got busy with their phones and iPhones while biting their nails, waiting for electricity to come back. Going to the bathroom, it was not possible to use the water taps as it used sensors as well. No electricity means the water tap sensors are not working and there's no water. It was my first experience of electricity cutoff in Oxford in England <laughs> and the first time to see how students react to that as well. During the same semester, and while sitting at my office, I heard an occasional thump of a bird crashed into the office window. Another poor bird went through the large window as it reflects the surrounding trees and sky. 
And while talking about sustainability and the green buildings, I used to remember how builders and architects are doing their best to bring life and to attract birds as well other animals to increase building biodiversity to what's so-called sustainable architecture or nature inclusive design. On the other extreme end of the meaning of the sustainability and biodiversity, due to conflict and crisis, I remember a couple of birds which came to build their nests at a hole in the wall of our home building in Gaza. These holes were made due to the shrapnel of bombing a nearby building by an Israel F-16 missile. I also remember and could not possibly forget the innocent Palestinian children who got shrapnel to their beautiful faces. Dalia, pictured over here, is one of them. If sustainable buildings can still kill nature life, in the places like Gaza, architecture can appear altogether distracted, almost a machine for killing a human life. On the contrary, it's the natural life that seems to be best equipped to inhabit such architecture, where birds learn to build their nests in what is left of the walls of humans, providing the latter with a totally unexpected source of empowerment and creativity. By putting the pictures, those two images together, what I'm trying to highlight over here is that your role, my role, is to heal the ones on the faces of the innocent children and to heal also the physical buildings and the physical structure and also to prevent further violence and conflict to take place. The building in Gaza are characterized with economy for materials, just using simple materials which is available when foreigners came to Gaza for the first time and he said, wow, the nice gray buildings you have. He thought that it's like German post the Second World War. Everything was gray in color. So as I said before that, it's mainly based on the necessity, out of necessity. And as you could see over here, the lack of urban and regional planning and prosperity. At the same time, the population is increasing while the available land is decreasing. In this sense, open spaces have evolved into closed spaces, producing a form of signage that is specific to box-like buildings. And this is what we use to call them in Arabic, boxes, just like boxes. My research questions are the following. Given the extensive constraints, what's my role? What's your role as, as a social worker, as an architect? And what about the results from the building and how permanent they should be? And giving the access to building materials, what's the appropriate type of construction without falling into the mud house or a tent, uh, a tent or a container trap? As you could see in this uh, slide, after the 2008-2009, uh, one of the UN agencies came to implement the mud house over here. They have implemented like 50 units out of 1,000. Thank God that they have implemented only 50 without being able to complete the project. In 2012, another NGO came with an idea of producing sand back shelters. In 2014, another NGO came with an idea of the wooden shelter. I will not name any names over here. The Catholic Relief Services actually they came with an idea of building this kind of transitional shelter solutions. Such architectural ad hoc actually projects that are intended as prototypes generally demonstrated a limited understanding of the morphology and the spatial formation of how people live in Gaza and the rest of Palestine and the rest of the region. The combination of the Israeli military events and the construction of temporary makeshift shelters have resulted in substantial demographic and social changes, especially for low-income extended families, as we will see in the next slide. In 2016, another artist came from Holland and she implemented the Rebel House. She took some artistic pictures, she went back to her country and she made an artistic like gallery in a white, clear space where people came and to see her artistic things. I wrote an open letter to her, asking her in a very polite way and asking the international NGOs in a very polite way, is it possible to stop having fun in Gaza? Is it possible to listen to the people? Is it possible to include them within the process? As you could see, one of the household mentioned that a wooden house, of course, is better than living in a tent. I live with my wife, with my two daughters and two of my unmarried sons. My other three sons rented homes to live in with their wives. As you could see over here, this is a typical uh, section of a typical Palestinian house where the social infrastructure 
uh, illustrated in this diagram, uh, showing that the extended family living together at a typical urban residential unit in Gaza. The house is shared by several generations of a family member where the elderly parents occupy the ground floor, which is easier for them to access and to move in and out and to receive guests. The first and the second floor are shared by their unmarried son and their wives and children. The uppermost level, uh, the columns are left there in expectation of future generation that can add more clothes if needed. The roof is, shared, is a shared space between the generation of different activities. So when such uh, a typical physical and social uh, infrastructure has been destroyed and being replaced by another transitional solution. So over here we are talking about destroying also the social fabric of the extended family and forcing family members to be displaced and to be fragmented instead of rebuilding them like a, a concrete structure. So you could only imagine the cost of such things. So by using or utilizing the cost, which might exceed the amount of uh, 55,000 or sometimes 40,000 40, $40, dollars. So you could uh, invest that thing in building a concrete structure for the extended families. Back to the most important research question, how to engage the community in the reconstruction process to empower them and to build their own simple yet appropriate homes, responding to their sociocultural practices. So I did some extensive field work between 2016 and 2018, working mainly on those areas that have been affected by the ongoing conflict in the buffer zones of the Gaza Strip. I used the ethnographic approach, which enabled me to access and to interact with local communities and to observe how they go about their everyday lives and learn about, how they, about their concerns and perception. As Christopher Day once mentioned that architects tend to think that architecture matters. Not everyone else does. To many people, buildings are expensive, but not very interesting. It's what goes on inside them that matters. So let us see what's going inside cubicle building in Gaza. I kept tracing this kind of movement within the building itself, trying to understand the daily habits, the daily routines of an extended family living together. And during that period, I also realized many things in relation to the ongoing conflict. So the Israelis used this technique of invading houses in Gaza, which has been used in the West Bank in Nablus, in the old uh, part of the, the, the Nablus city by moving from one area to another area through houses, because you know it was quite dangerous for them to walk in the streets because of the sniper. So they used houses and they have made holes into such houses to keep moving from one house uh, to another. During one of my field visits, I was going to make a need assessment for one of the houses but it was locked from inside. So we asked one of the, their children to get, up, get us inside after taking the permission of his parents. So he kept climbing the wall and I kept taking some pictures for him while thinking about the perception of the family itself when they got back to their house to find such holes in their bedroom and their bathroom and to, to see what's going on by the, the occupation hall. During 2016, it was my first visit to Gaza after spending one year and a half in, in Oxford. I was trying to get the English sense of humor by watching a British movie. Do you know the name of this one? Oh, I think it's nephew. Are you English? Hmm? No. <laughs> Go Irish. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, it's, an, it's an English film, actually. And I was trying to understand or to get the perception of uh, the English sense of humor. So I tried to concentrate and to, to watch the, the, the film. But I got some technical or image distortion in my TV sitting. Do you know why? What's the reason behind getting this kind of distortion? Uh, the technical explanation within the private space of the, the home, of my home, your home, and when there is a compact drone aircraft flying in the sky of Gaza, signal powers of the drone is being interfered feared with the satellite digital signals. Life beneath the drones in Gaza is still going on. The drones have become Israel's weapon of choice in its attacks on Gaza. In Israel's Operation Protective Edge in 2014 attack, nearly 37% of those killed died in drone attacks. This kind of example could be used to show how, to show that the public and the private are in an expected way mixed together. While you watch TV to forget about your daily life in Gaza, you are painfully and even fatally reminded of it. 
you have the feeling that you are being watched and absorbed most of your time. So this is just to give you a brief about our movement within that limited piece of land, about the movement and the life of like nearly two million people within that piece of land. Back to the to the to the reality and to being a good listeners and to engaging the families and highlighting them and to uh, giving back a credit to them because they they kept teaching me so many things in relation to design. I, I, I kept interviewing them and uh, learning through their experience and also conducting some uh, design participatory sessions with them. And I also tried to make a recognition of the inverted of the specific and to highlight such uh, rituals that had been uh, done in their daily basis and how they might be related to design. So I kept observing women cooking and making uh, bread while the husbands or the workers are cooking the cement blocks because blocks these days or cement these days, according to the complicated Gaza reconstruction mechanism, is disputed among families using cement vouchers, exactly or similarly to the food vouchers have been given to families in need. So translating the dimension that has been needed. So I came with some ideas and some like design manual that could be used for foreigners or for international NGOs who are willing to uh, implement such housing uh, or shelter projects uh, in Gaza. I also kept tracing uh, the natural growth of some families, some extended families over a certain period of time, like 10 or 15 years, trying to understand why they are doing or implementing or going this way or that way as well. So the outcome of my PhD research was like a house design prototype <coughs> that I could see how much I could use the idea of the architecture of every day as the vernacular while engaging the communities within the process of the design itself. Finally, I would like to uh, dedicate this uh, presentation and talk to the late uh, American architect, Michael Sorkin, who passed away almost like March two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic and he was like a human right and a peace building activist and who was also the editor of his last book open gaza i was having the pleasure of meeting her for the first and the last time in 2015 during the first open gaza conference and he was very supportive actually finally i did this quick sketch and in one of the boring greek lectures in, in oxford trying to imagine a better future for for my people you could see the, the, the donkey cart, uh, the, the kusuk selling falafel and hummus, the children are running while smiling and laughing. Thank you so much for listening. Let's open it up for questions and comments. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start and sort of maybe you can say a few more words about the size of restriction with respect to the material coming in, just like you mentioned a few minutes ago about how um, the cement is being cooked. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, actually these days, and exactly after the 2014 attacks, Norway came with, the, with, with an idea of something called the Gaza reconstruction mechanism. So if my house, God forbid, anyone's house, God forbid, that has been destroyed, that he has to apply for the Ministry of Public Work and Housing, then the Ministry is going to send some engineers to make a detailed list about the exact required quantity to reconstruct this house or that house, either partially or totally. And then you have to submit the documents, et cetera, et cetera. And it will take months and months and months of waiting in a long list for the Israelis to allow you to get your construction material. And you have to go to a specific contractor or a specific material supplier, which has been provided with cameras, which, which is connected directly with the Israeli side to make sure that you are get, getting this exact quantity of cement or this exact quantity of steel bars or aggregate, etc. Otherwise, you do have the other alternative of buying materials from the black market, which is very expensive, and most of the extended families and low-income families could not afford to do that. So this is uh, the, the technique or the reconstruction mechanism that has started since 2014 and still ongoing right now, maybe like five or six years, and most of the families are really suffering from that thing. And most of the NGOs could not implement any projects right now because of that kind of siege and blockade and the Gaza reconstruction mechanism as well. Question? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned it in passing, but I wonder if you can explain a little bit more with the idea behind, I mean, the big challenge in, of reconstruction in Gaza is that you reconstruct 
at an environment of continued destruction. You can anticipate the next round of violence. You can anticipate that there'll be more destruction than. I guess this is a practical, but also an emotional and psychological question about how, for you as an architect, how do you how do you deal with that challenge of uh, construction in a with an anticipation of continued destruction? Exactly. Actually, this was one of the hardest questions that I kept asking me, asking myself while being a reconstruction actually architect of uh, the emergency architect responsible respons who's responsible for writing like uh, grant proposals, like two, three million dollars for each and every project. I'm thinking about the same thing, but what's the use of, of doing that thing again and again? And to my surprise, the answer came from the people themselves. So for example, if you have a look at such a, a total destroyed house like this, the owner of the house is going to sell the gold of his wife, and he's going to borrow money from relatives, from neighbors, whatever, to reconstruct his own house again, using concrete and making it with stronger foundations and writing on the top of that building in Arabic, if you return back to destroy my house, I'm going to re reconstruct it again. So it seems this kind of idea of having a permanent thing because mainly the Palestinian people have been uprooted from their villages and from their cities like decades ago. So this kind of having a permanent structure is the ideal thing and, and opposite to, to, to having these kind of, sorry. Yeah. And opposite to having these kind of temporary makeshift uh, structures. And of course, you know, uh, at the beginning, the families have no, nothing to say. It's like giving them a food parcel, take it or leave it. If you are going to take it, okay. Otherwise we do have a long list. But recently, many families started to reject such solutions because what they are looking, they are looking for something permanent. They know that within each and every two or three years, attacks might happen again. But this is actually their way, only way to survive and to keep their extended family members living all together. And during the last two years, between 2018 and 2019, even while dealing with a minority of a group of women, a widowed woman who lost their husbands because of the attacks, I kept hearing the same thing. Please, it's a dream for me to have a concrete wall or a concrete slab on the top of my head before dying. It's their dream to have a concrete slab, not for themselves actually, but for their children, because they want to keep their children to get married and to keep them within the same uh, extended family uh, structure. That's uh, obvious in, 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 in this image or in this, this section to the left. So again, if you are going to destroy it, I'm going to rebuild it again using concrete and making it with a stronger foundation. And it was part of the struggle also when I started making those drawings for the sake of my PhD, I kept uh, getting the questions, why you are showing the, uh, the foundations? Why are you not showing only the, the movement of the people? Because the, phys the physical structure over here, the strong foundation are totally related to the social infrastructure of the Gaza community. So you do have uh, a dream that within 20 or 30 years, he will keep adding more rooms or uh, flats on the top of that. And one of my students uh, called it the columns of hope because whenever you see those columns coming out, it's there in Latin America and India and many countries actually that we do have the columns with the steel bars. So it's giving hope for the family that they are going to, 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 to add on the top of that because the land is very limited and there is no open spaces. And I hope that, that gives an answer to your question. Questions? I have a quick question. I, I remember in the uh, latest attack on Gaza last year, there was um, footage of a mom saying, or I forgot the exact details, but so basically Gazans were sleeping together in the same room. So if that building would collapse, they would all die together. Yeah rather than some of them surviving and basically surviving without the loved ones. Mm -hmm. So now here, like the building as a place of refuge and shelter are also mercy, but they die down together. I don't know if you're- Yeah, some families, some families actually, uh, some families, thank you so much for that good point. Some families started sending their children to other families. So in the case of uh, being targeted, that they will <coughs> make sure that at least one or two or three family of their family members, mem members managed to, to make it and to, sur to survive because 
even I'm getting a similar thing. Why not to build like uh, shelters underneath the ground? Why? But nothing could stand in front of F-16 missile action. And shelters underneath is, is, is not a good idea because it's as if you are collecting uh, a group of people at one place. And this is what happened exactly in 2014 attacks actually when the Israelis uh, attacked one specific uh, Norway school. And as you know that Norway schools are mainly for people who have been displaced. So by attacking such schools, it was yeah, the same thing about collecting some people in the uh, same, same place. Yes, please. Um, I thought the example that you gave of the bread and space was really lovely, and I was wondering if there were other designs that were similar that you worked on that you might want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, like what other sort of practical tasks yeah. you use to inform your design? Uh, I started by observing like simple, simple things like uh, laundry handy, uh, hanging, for example, and uh, visiting them between 11 a.m. and uh, 2 p.m., mainly it's the lunchtime over there in, in, in Palestine, to observe, I mean, the movement of uh, their children uh, going back, uh, their movement around the place, etc., etc. So in addition to bread making and making exactly the dimension or the required dimension, I also realized that they are in need of the so-called microfinance things because, you know, some of them are trying to sell something or to make bread and to give it to the neighbors or to go to the to the top of their houses so i also included in my in my design this kind of uh, space that could be converted into like a grocery shop in the morning and at night it could be used for other purposes so it should be located in the front of their houses and they could sell some grocery bakery cookies whatever or things that had been Handmade. So I kept including those things in relation to uh, their feedback. So when I went back to make the first draft of my design, I kept sending some of the families the, the drawing, the sketches that, that I did and taking their feedback. And this is how I have managed to complete or to make like uh, a prototype. So it's not like specific for one area, but it's general that could be used by, by other uh, agencies or the Ministry of Public Work and Housing. And since that time, it was my struggle with them just to, to, to be a good listener or to, to have uh, listening to the communities and including them within the process. Uh, can you uh, introduce the slide of the exhibit? It's a nice clean. Yeah. Um, and maybe just uh, unpack a little bit more. Uh, more. Yeah, uh, the artist actually, she's in her 60s. So uh, when I wrote to her for the first time, I thanked her actually for uh, taking the rest. Uh, the risk and for taking uh, the physical efforts to enter Gaza and to get the permit, because I do understand the efforts that she 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 has input to do the thing. But my concerns were the following: that it's exactly as you are burning like a huge amount of money by no, doing nothing and also by not including the families. Because later on, when I was in contact with a couple of journalists, I came to know that that she asked the family not to touch the house until the spring when she got the sun because she would like to take some artistic photos for, for that house and preventing the family to use their own house for a certain period of time because, you know, it was like a winter season during that time. So, so this is my only concern that you have to, to have a respect to the people that you are working for. Okay, fine, we're getting some fame being there and I might be misusing my people as well standing over here and talking on their behalf. But what I'm trying to say over here that we should give the credit back. So I kept learning from them. And this this is what encouraged me actually the most to, to write that open letter to her and to the, the other NGOs asking them in a very polite way that is it possible to stop having fun in Gaza and to include the people within the process and to keep listening to them as simple as that. And I have got no response from her like that. And a few other questions. <laughs> yes. uh, I wonder if you found the uh, variations in relation to construction building space in relation to the communities, you know, Gazans versus uh, refugees, uh, uh, peasants versus uh, city dwellers. If you can speak about variations yeah. across Gaza. Yeah. It's, to your have you been to Gaza before? Many years ago. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a very good question because to my surprise, being from Gaza and also being uh, 
like a Muslim, a native Arabic uh, speaker, etc., while dealing with uh, some communities in the southern part of Gaza, which is the Shoka, Rafa. So this part is totally like a Bedouin community, right? Uh, my name is Salem. Salem is considered to be an old Hebrew name, an Arabic name, so I used to switch it to Suela to look more Bedouin, actually. <laughs> but they will immediately uh, recognize it because of my accent that I'm not from this community, actually. So they will immediately start using their own uh, Bedouin language that they could not understand, even being a native uh, Arabic speaker. So you are absolutely right. And uh, I started realizing this kind of micro, 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 micro example. For example, it's not possible for me to enter the house to make this kind of need assistance if the man is not there. So I have to have respect for the presence of the man. While in the north, it's normal because we do have so many cousins and relatives taking care of, of that thing. And also the openings, the size of the openings. In the Bidden community, they prefer to have the opening like two meters or two uh, and a half meters on the top of your head so you will not invade the privacy. In the northern part of that small piece of land, it's normal to have windows on this level and to have it with large windows because it's more an agricultural society and where cousins and extended families are living all together within the same neighborhood. So it's a very good question in relation to the design actually. Uh, uh, elements that have been used in terms of opening, privacy, the, the height of ceiling. So I highlighted uh, a couple of those things in, in my research. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. Uh, following up, I guess, on, on thinking about windows, when I was looking at your pictures, I was also wondering about how in your design you think about um, light and heat and things when knowing, as you sort of mentioned, that, that electricity may be cut for um, most hours of the day in mm -hmm. Gaza, like um, if it's only concrete, it's very dark, like how, yeah. how, how, how do you think about, about yeah. that in terms yeah. of the architecture? We have like serious problems that most of those buildings, or let us say all of them, as you can see, this picture that I took from the uh, uh, the roof of our apartment in Gaza, as you could see that they have no proper insulation uh, during uh, the, 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 the summer, it's extremely hot and during the winter as well. And there is no good use for the rooftops of the houses in terms of making like small pocket gardens or small roof gardens. So it's a serious problem, but we need like some policies to be implemented either through the Ministry of Public Work and Housing and other agency to uh, enforce such, I mean, uh, regulations that the people who start accepting it. Uh, also collecting uh, rainwater, rainwater harvesting. So because most of the water is running into the sewage and then it comes to the sea. But since the last maybe five or 10 years, we started to think seriously about how we could include these kind of inclusive things within the design process. In terms of opening, I could not open a window right now. At my own apartment, I could not open the window because the neighbor, I do have like a limited space, like three to five meters, which is like the buffer zone between my building and the other building, because as you could see over here, it's overcrowding. The land is shrinking, is limited. The area of the strip itself, while people and the natural growth of people is exceed, exceeding 2 million right now. So we have to think seriously about such solutions in terms of design. Yes, please. Just in terms of the architecture, you mentioned that you spoke so beautifully to how you think about the intra-home relationships. Yeah. And I'm wondering about how you think about the inter-home relationships between homes that are close to one another and how yeah. that affects the design. Yeah. Uh, as I said at the beginning, intimindarmin or intimindarmin from which home or that means the intersection is quite strong because we are living all together. So whenever you are approaching uh, my area or my neighborhood, I'm not going to look for your house number. We do not use house numbers. <laughs> we use the family name. So I'm looking for the Qudwa family, uh, whatever, in order to approach this building or that building. And whenever you are entering a specific neighborhood, you will feel that uh, everyone knows uh, the other, and you are the only stranger within that. Uh, that area, so they will approach you and they will ask you what are you doing, could we help you in a polite way. So yeah, neighbors are living together, sharing food sometimes, and also I include such things within my design that uh, considering not only the, the prototype as an isolated actually building, but rather than being part of the entire fabric, and that was the main reason for the final slide, the sketch that when I imagined a better future, that 
houses are near to each other, the children are running, sharing food, women uh, having laundry hanging and making these kind of mutual things. So it's very important that to consider it as, as one whole uh, piece rather than dealing. And this is one of the actually uh, failures of such NGOs that they are taking those transitional things as copy paste from this area to that area, assuming that with respect to Syria, Iraq, that countries are, are, are alike, actually are totally different, even as you have thankfully asked within that small period of land, which is the, uh, the gas uh, habits and rituals are totally different from one geographic area. Mm -hmm. I have one, I guess, one question about, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with forensic uh, architecture. Uh, A.R. Weizmann's, uh, uh, I mean, I know forensic architecture, it basically display, displays uh, destruction. Hmm. And I wonder if you were ever thinking about, you know, if you join the team, how would you add the, you know, the last page of the project bringing construction? I mean, I'm just, you know, but this is a conversation with the lots of other people. I don't think that I'll join the team one day. <laughs> I don't think that I'll be joining one team. I, I do have my own, yeah, perception towards that because... Yeah. Oh, so here's an opening. Go ahead, tell me what you think. Yeah, about it's mainly about, uh, they're doing actually great work. Yeah, but oh, maybe uh, to explain to speak to other people who are not familiar with yeah. forensic architecture. Maybe you maybe you could to... say something about it. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so um, for that, that field of forensic architecture is associated with the, the work of Eli like, Whiteman. Uh, there was a really excellent um, Al Jazeera uh, short documentary um, about what this forensic architecture is about. You can Google Eli yeah, Whiteman like, forensic architecture and see it. Uh, and what he does is, well, first of all, it highlights um, how the whole um, structure of it, looking specifically at the West End, um, the architecture of control, how it plays out spatially with respect to like the, um, the watchtower, the walls. And so the watchtower, you don't know if there is a person behind the watchtower. Mm. So you're, you always feel observed, kind of like what Simon was talking about, like, you know, constantly the drone person in the sky, you're always observed. So you, you um, imagine what it means to look at that. Um, you know, but not to mention that, you know, that you're being like assassinated um, uh, at any moment. But um, uh, so, 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 so you come to this understanding of how the, the architecture of control of the space uh, operates. And then uh, the forensic architecture looks at what exactly what um, Simon showed us um, slide with the uh, uh, how the military goes through building mm -hmm. structure because they don't go through the main um, uh, streets because that, that will turn them into targets. Uh, so they, they develop all kind of like, uh, practice of um, urban fighting that is exported to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to, you know, it's very much in conversation with the, with the US. Um, and it's through well, it's invented by the Brits, actually. Yeah, know. okay, yeah, yeah. So do you want to continue? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, uh, this is a. The yeah, so, so there is a lot of um, uh, not, not, uh, not sharing. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and part of what the forensic architect does be is forensic to, to show, to take it to like, you know, major spaces like human rights, um, kind of, uh, uh, oversight spaces, um, uh, uh, to demonstrate the kind of, you know, the crimes that happen, to kind of the, telling the story of what happened to, you know, families in uh, buildings. You know, were incorporated into um, you know, the, the, the bombing, the violence, and um, so it's really kind of like detective work, therefore forensic. <laughs> if, if, you, if you allow yeah. me to give you an answer, but uh, from my own, uh, when I started uh, my PhD after being a practitioner for like 13 years and working working uh, with communities, when I gave my first presentation showing like simple things like sketches and listening to people. In academia, they started telling me, ah, you are doing participatory uh, planning. You are doing participatory design. This is called ethnography. You are an ethnographer. And by the way, th that was the first time that I heard about such, I mean, was in academia. And then I promised my supervisor in the first year, despite being 
uh, despite the fact that I was still funding my PhD in the first year in Oxford, and Oxford is very expensive actually, I promised her that I'm not going to mention three words in my research, which is resilience, <laughs> conflict, and sustainability. <laughs> And she told me, Salem, you are wrong. I agree with you on resilience, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me, actually, she told me, Salem, I'm afraid that to tell you that you are wrong. You are desperately, desperately looking for funds. You do not have a scholarship. And those words are very, like, attractive. So from my own understanding, I told her that translating those Arabic, even for an, for an, for, forensic. forensic architecture, <laughs> sustainable building, green buildings, resilience design, translating them to Arabic, it doesn't mean anything to the normal ordinary man. It doesn't mean anything for an ordinary English or American man who's uh, worried or struggling with his paycheck to paycheck, with his normal life, with his urban life. So I'm afraid to say that we are misusing sometimes such, I mean, terminologies or things and labeling things without having an idea that uh, we are using a blind language, a total blind language. So for me, at least, as an architect, or for someone who's trying to be a good architect, for me, that design is simple, a plan, a section, and uh, a good place to, to, to live without having an idea that I'm going to get back to my people so then that I did a resilient design or I did a sustainable or a green building thing. So with respect, actually, for their great and wonderful effort to bring more attention, which is good, actually. But in terms of bringing something more tangible, this is my point of view, actually, because I'm working closely with the community. So at the end of the day, they are, they are just looking for a decent shelter or a decent house to, to, to live in. With respect to their great work, of course, and bringing an international attention from the human rights uh, point of view, from the legal point of view, etc., etc. it's very important. But when it comes to uh, communities in need, they are just looking for, for a place to live. Mm -hmm. well, um... Unless there is another urgent question, um, I think that we can now uh, conclude the session. So let's thank um, Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure.